Hey guys, Chris here with The Good Old Gamer. So today we're going to be starting our new IPC series where we track the performance from the Pentium 4 era up to modern and see exactly where the biggest gains were throughout history and where the disparities came in. Now in this video, we're gonna start off talking about the testing methodology, what IPC actually is, and then of course, checking out the NetBurst architecture from Intel through the Pentium 4 and Pentium D CPUs. So go ahead and stay tuned and check it out. Hey guys, if you like videos like this, please consider becoming a patron over on Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you can seriously help me out in getting tech on hands so we can do more videos like this one right here. I want to thank everybody for their support, and links will be in the description below. Now on to the video. So first off, what is IPC? If you go ahead and jump on Google and search for what is IPC or CPU IPC, this is what pops up for Wikipedia, instructions per cycle. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and read their explanation here and explain to you why this isn't the correct explanation for this. Okay, the number of instructions per second and floating point operations per second for a processor can be delivered by multiplying the number of instructions per cycle with the clock rate cycles per second giving in hertz of the processor in question. The number of instructions per second is an approximate indicator of likely performance of the processor. Now, factors governing IPC, this I think is an important little bit in here too. A given level of instructions per second can be achieved with high IPC and low clock speeds like the AMD Athlon and the early Intel Core series. So like the Core 2s, they had lower clock speeds or from low IPC and high clock speeds like the Pentium 4, which we'll be checking out today, or to a lesser extent, the AMD Bulldozer. Both are valid processor designs, and the choice between the two is often dictated by history, engineering constraints, and marketing pressures. However, high IPC and high frequencies give the best performance. Okay, so what they're defining as IPC is its single precision and double precision IPC numbers. So if we take a look, for example, Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge here on single precision, they're saying that it has an IPC of 16. However, going to Haswell to Coffee Lake, they're showing 32 IPC. Now, we know for a fact that at 4 gigahertz, a Sandy or Ivy Bridge CPU is not half as fast as an Intel Haswell or Coffee Lake. We know that there are other governing factors there. Some publications such as Guru3D do a really good job at testing IPC in the more modern way that we look at it. And if we scroll on down, this is their 2700X review here. So this is a newer one. Instructions per cycle. Uh, below is their IPC test, and they use Cinebench 15, which is something that we will also be using here, as this is the industry standard for testing IPC because it delivers consistent results, and it's very simple to go ahead and test a single core and a single thread, which is really, really handy. Now, all cores were fixed at 3.5 gigahertz or 3,500 megahertz. Now, this is the way that we look at IPC today is comparing clock for clock. And what we're really testing is actually architectural advancements. Not so much the fact that it can clock higher equals higher IPC. The fact that at the same clock, we see a difference, even though if we look back over here, Coffee Lake has 32 single floating point precision uh, bits there, and then so does Ryzen. So according to these, there should be no difference on these scales if they're clocked at the same speed. Now going back to Guru 3D here, we obviously see that that's not the case. Now they are pretty similar and they are close in performance, but the numbers do differ. So this is the way that IPC is actually interpreted by the tech community. It's not so much going off of the official instructions per cycle per se. So when you hear IPC, this is actually what the vast majority of people are talking about. Now that doesn't mean if somebody says IPC using different clock speeds is technically wrong because it's not a set standard. Obviously, Guru 3D does not agree with the official definition. So we are going to be using this definition, the most common one used where we are testing clock for clock and we're basically testing for architectural advancements throughout time.
All right, so for testing methodology, this is going to vary a little bit between people, but I tried to go ahead and figure out the absolute most baseline fair way to go ahead and test CPU spanning massive generations. Now we're talking about Pentium 4 era all the way up to modern. Now the reason why we're doing that is because Cinebench R15 requires a 64-bit operating system. Now the Pentium 4 some of them did support 64-bit and some didn't. So we had to use later era Pentium 4 CPUs, which is fine for the most part. The, I mean, it's the same architecture, but it did change a little bit. So earlier era Pentium 4s won't perform quite as well as these ones. Uh, and of course, the AMD 64 does support a 64-bit operating system. So that was a limiting factor here and is the main reason why we had to start at this particular point. We can't really test anything earlier as we would have to use a different benchmark and then that kind of throws everything off. Cinebench R15 is the industry standard, as I mentioned before, because it does deliver consistent results and the fact that it's pretty easy to get up and running for the most part. The way that we're doing this is we're clocking all CPUs to 3 gigahertz. Now, not each generation has CPUs that clock at that exact clock speed. So I will be using a Core 2 X6800 at 2.93 gigahertz uh, for the Conroe benchmark, basically to test that out. Now, this is not 3 gigahertz, of course. This is 2.93. It is a frontside bus of 266 times the multiplier of 11, and then you get 2926 megahertz. Now, the only way to balance this out is to go ahead and raise the frontside bus a little bit, which is technically overclocking, up to about 270. I think that this is the perfect number for balance, times 11, then it comes out to being 2970. So even though that this is a little bit below the three gigahertz mark, it is technically overclocked a bit on the frontside bus. So this is a balancing act that I think will work out just fine. The Linfield and the Halem architectures are kind of the same way. They don't scale on a 100. Basically, the FSB is not 100. All the Sandy Bridge on newer Intel CPUs, they do, so it's easy to hit 3 gigahertz flat. But on these CPUs, we're going to have to go ahead and play a little fast and loose on that. Now, the next thing is going to be memory balancing. Since we're going to be spanning DDR2 all the way to DDR4, we're going to have to figure out a way to make it fair. Now, Cinebench R15 isn't very memory dependent, but at the same time, we're trying to have this as balanced as humanly possible. So this is the best overall representation of IPC spanning the entire CPU history. So we're going to be starting off with DDR2 800 megahertz here today. And the timings on that are 44412. And everything's going to be running at the 2T command rate because some CPUs have trouble running at 1T. With 2T, we can guarantee that they will all work just fine. So going to DDR3, we're going to double the frequency up from 800 to 1600, but we are also going to be doubling the latencies across the board. And then once again for DDR4, another doubling. So even though DDR2 800 megahertz is one fourth the speed of DDR4 3200, we also have one fourth the latencies. Now this is the best way I came up with to balance this out. Now we know for a fact that 444 timings are really good compared to 16, 16, 16. But once again, you do have the bandwidth making up that difference. So once again, this is kind of a balancing act, but I think that this is the most fair way to do this across the board. Next up is the test bench itself. So today we're going to be testing three CPUs from Intel, the Pentium 4 630 and two Pentium Ds, uh, the 830 and 930, all of which run at a stock core speed of three gigahertz. And three gigahertz will be the number that we're shooting for across the board in all of our IPC tests. And once again, like I said, it's because we can get every CPU to that point with relative ease. Now, a key note here is the Pentium 4 630 has a 2 megabyte L2 cache and does support hyperthreading. The Pentium Ds do not support hyperthreading, but these are dual core CPUs. The difference between the 830 and the 930 is the Pentium D has 1 megabyte of L2 cache per core, so 2 total, and the 930 has 2 megabytes of L2 cache per core, so 4 total. So theoretically, the 630 and 930 are more alike than the 830. But we will go ahead and see if that extra L2 cache really delivers any extra performance, or if it's just basically they wanted more money for the 930 series and said, hey, here's more cache. So that's something we'll be checking out, and that's one of the things that I want to see in these benchmark tests is if that actually makes any real difference, or if you can get away with the lower L2 cache and just be just fine. 
The motherboard we're using today is the MSI P7N SLI, which is based off of an NVIDIA 750i SLI chipset. Yes, NVIDIA used to make motherboards. Uh, this is before Intel started locking them out, and then AMD followed suit shortly thereafter. But NVIDIA's motherboards, the 750i, was considered one of the best bang for the bucks throughout the generation. So this is a good board for testing. It's not super high-end, not super premium. Now, the reason why the motherboard is really important here is because the 775 socket CPUs do not have an integrated memory controller or an IMC. So that's actually based off of the motherboard chipset. So making sure that we're providing balanced motherboards between the two uh, CPUs here is important because we don't want to have any sort of advantage there. So that's why I went with a mid to high end or a low high end motherboard chipset. I didn't want the best because that's not representative of realistic expectations and performance in the world. So this is a good balance. And honestly, I got this thing at a great price. So I was very happy with picking this up. I also have an NVIDIA chipset for the AMD 64s for the next video. So that balances things out even further. Uh, as mentioned before, we are using G-Scale DDR4 800 megahertz. Uh, we can skip past that. The test bench slash case that I'm using is the Thermaltake Core P3SE. So if you're interested in setting up your own little test bench, this guy is pretty much the best bang for the buck for this. It's very versatile. Uh, you can click the links in the description below. I have all the more modern parts available down there if you're interested in setting up your own test bench. Uh, I'm just using a basic Thermaltake TR2 600 watt power supply. It's got the ketchup and mustard looking wires. It's nothing special, but it's 600 watts and that's more than we're going to need. We're not overclocking here. We're running everything at stock, so no biggie. And we're not even really taxing the GPU, honestly. Um, I wanted to go straight SSD on this one. I'm using a PNY 1311 uh, 120 gig SATA 3 SSD. Nothing super special here, but this eliminates the bottleneck of a mechanical hard drive. And of course, this is going to max out the SATA 2 bus on the 750i SLI chipset. So this is going to keep it more balanced. It's just quicker for testing. So just makes sense just throwing everything on an SSD. Now, I didn't put Windows on here. We're just running Windows 7, 64-bit, SP1, nothing else, just drivers and Cinebench. There's nothing else on the system. The cooler is just a basic Cooler Master Hyper TX3. It's a 92 millimeter cooler. It's easy to pop in and take off. So that's the reason why I went with that for this testing. Once again, we're not overclocking and the CPU temperatures were well within tolerance. They were actually extremely low. We're testing only a single core. Besides the Pentium 4, everything else has more than one core anyway. Uh, so this was more than adequate to go ahead and keep our system cool while we're testing. And then I'm using the old GeForce 4 GTX 770 for my budget build, uh, just because I need a GPU in here. And this one is one of the more modern GPUs I just have laying around. So figured might as well throw that on here. Well, alrighty guys, if you're unfamiliar with Cinebench R15, it's a very simple and free benchmark. The reason why everybody uses it is because you can go out and test these things yourself if you'd like. And as I said a few times already, it delivers very consistent results, and that's the reason why it's used. So let's go ahead and see what our results are. So kicking things off, we're going to take a look at the Pentium 4 630, and that showed up with a Cinebench single core performance number of 36. Now this is very, very slow to watch. If you've ever seen more modern CPUs running Cinebench, it just blows through it. Uh, for example, here's the Ryzen 1600X that I have running through this thing with all threads. I mean, it just blows through it. But on a single core Pentium 4, this was very slow and it's only popping up with a score of 36. Now, here's the most interesting benchmark. Like I said, the Pentium D830 with half the L2 cache actually went ahead and outperformed the Pentium 4 630 by two points. Now, this is a five and a half percent increase over the Pentium 4, even though it has lower L2 cache, which is kind of crazy. Now, let's see how it compares to the 930 with the two megabytes of L2 cache per core. And now that one's coming up at 39. So this is only one more point above the 830. So the extra cache on the Pentium D and presumably also on the Pentium 4 really isn't making much of a difference. Although this is an architectural change because it is more cache, that is a change to the architecture overall, it doesn't really benefit the CPUs much at all here. Now, I know these benchmarks aren't super exciting, so that's the reason why I had to go ahead and put them up like this. Now, I'm going to go ahead and show you on a scale of up to 300, which there's nothing that's going to be hitting a Cinebench 
single thread performance score at 3 gigahertz. Nothing's going to be hitting this for a very long time. But showing you on a regular scale, you can see that these are all virtually identical. For the most part, the netburst architecture, which these are all netburst here, um, this is basically the range that they're in. And you could probably chalk this up to margin of error for the most part, but these scores were extremely consistent. The way we went ahead and tested this is I've tested each one five times, disregarded the top score, the bottom score, and only averaged out the three middle scores. Now... Realistically speaking, the Pentium Ds did not deviate. All five scores were identical, and the Pentium 4 hopped between 36 and 37. 36 happened to win out. It was uh, on there three times out of the five tests versus two times on the 37. But I guess you can say it's 36 and a half if you wanted to be 100% accurate. But realistically speaking, one point's not going to make a huge difference, much like on the 830 to 930. Looking at this graph, you can see it's basically all the same. Now, I know that's not super exciting. There's only three CPUs on there. Now, this is going to grow, of course. As time goes on, we'll do more tests and we're going to add them all together. That's the reason why in this video I went through all the testing methodology and all that kind of stuff. So we can get that out of the way and we can move forward in the next videos and look more into benchmarks and the reasons why things are the way that they are. The next video is going to be super exciting. It's going to be the Athlon 64, the K8 architecture, and how it compared to the Pentium 4, Pentium D era netburst architecture. Now, anybody who was into PCs back then knows that AMD had the superior CPU. But how much better was it really? We can literally put numbers to that here in the next video. And if you like what these videos are, please go ahead and consider supporting us on Patreon. Uh, that's really the way that I'm going to need to go ahead and get all of these CPUs so I can keep presenting these pieces of uh, content for you guys. I think that this is super interesting, but I'm, I'm really stoked. I have not tested any of the Athlon 64s yet. I'm going to set that up probably later today because I want a sneak peek. I'm super curious to see how much better the Athlon 64 was than the Pentium 4. Maybe it's a lot better. Maybe it's not that much better. You know, maybe our revisionist history in our brains uh, might have changed things around. I don't know. But that's the exciting part about this test. Let's figure it out together. Well, already, guys, if you like this kind of video, please hit that like button. Please subscribe. Please share with friends. Once again, please help support me on Patreon. The faster I can get this stuff in, the faster I can get these videos out to you guys. And that's all I have for today. And I will catch you guys in the next video.